you cannot singularly describe Dick Ebersol, but think about this, that there is no other sporting event, certainly domestically and perhaps globally, where I mention the event Olympics and you immediately assign a network to it, NBC. Uh, Dick Ebersol is joining us. Dick, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure, Colin. Big thrill. Thanks. Um, what is the responsibility of a network that spent a billion dollars or more and needs to promote patriotism and the athletes and get some money back? Because you are now responsible when you were running the Olympics and NBC Sports. You had a boss, too. What is the responsibility to talk about the ugly side of Rio? Well, I think it's the same as the responsibility is for, for every Olympic. I mean, you, after having done as many as I had the good fortune to do, I kind of have gotten used to the fact that the vast majority of Olympic cities have uh, what seem to be daunting problems in the lead up to the games. And in many cases, people go, oh, my God, will they ever be ready or will this controversy go away? And as you and I both know that 99% of the time, once the athletes are center stage, most of that stuff goes away. Rio has some, some serious issues. I don't have Zika high on that list because I've always been a believer that this time of the year would lessen the probability of there being very many, if any of them. And the people I really respected, which were not anybody to do with the organizing of the games, but some medical people, they felt that in, during the period of the games, if in the entirety of all the people visiting Rio, which I think is about a half a million people, they were really going to be surprised if there were more than 20 or 30 people who would be bit due to the fact that the cooler temperatures, particularly at night, mitigate against uh, those bugs breeding. But the other problems, the infrastructure of that city, certainly the fact that even though the security is up to 85,000 police and military people, now many of them are taking over jobs that a private security company was supposed to be working on for years, and they were let go two weeks ago. Yes. So, yeah, it's enough It's enough to give you some trepidation. And what, what, what I always tried to do, and I know uh, Jim Bell, who at least on the production side has most of the job I used to have, um, their plans for instantaneous ability to cover the news, uh, I don't think have ever changed since – I got there in 1989. You're 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 ready. You have obviously in Bob Costas somebody who's always eager to show off that he has news chops as well as a great knowledge of all sports. So you're 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 pretty ready for whatever will happen. I think the the one thing in Rio because of the the incredible congestion of so many of those streets in the old section and the favelas and stuff like that. I don't think anybody will rest totally comfortably, Colin, until the last athlete has gotten on the plane on the day after the closing ceremony. Did but, you, Dick, did you ever have an Olympics that were more daunting? That, that, that actually, did you have a toughest Olympics? Uh, well, two, but only one from the angle you're coming at. Um, Greece, uh, had an awful lot of uh, issues. In fact, I never believed, honestly, Colin, until seven days before the opening ceremony that Greece would be uh, done on time. And then all of a sudden, driving down a super highway uh, for about 10 miles and seeing all this work that literally a month before looked like it had never be, been be finished was um, – you also had enormous problems right up till about four months before the games because this wonderful woman who had gone out and gotten the games for the for Athens seven years before, as soon as she got the games, all the guys cut her out of the action. And it was only four and a half months before the games that they were smart enough to bring her back. And she had enough strong relationships, not only in her own country, but throughout the world. She took care of the basic organization issues as it came to the athletes and getting everybody comfortable. And sure. then the United States very, very quietly. And I was aware of this much more so than for any other Olympics. Their anti-terrorism people were heavily involved in plotting out so much of the preparedness. And it was preached to me that one of the things the Arab community, the Middle Eastern community, 
had really strong uh, relationships through the years with uh, with Greece, and it was just thought that so many people, including Arafat, who I'm pretty sure was still alive at the time, this just wasn't going to be, unless it was a one-off terrorist, this wasn't going to be the issue that so much of the the International Journalist Society was predicting that it was going to be. Dick Ebersall, former chairman, NBC Sports, and the Olympics Hall of Fame for both, is joining us here in The Herd. Um, you, you mentioned terrorism and the cost, and historically in America we have a we have a recession every six years post-World War II. We've gone eight years without one. There's global economic concerns. It's a different world, Dick. Do the Olympics make sense economically going forward? Yeah, I think they do, because in most instances, Colin, uh, it's only what the government in that country can afford can afford to put up. And what we've seen recently, particularly with uh, Sochi and before that Beijing, they really, both the Chinese and the Russians, wanted to use those games as sort of a coming out party of sorts. For sure. the Chinese, it was literally their coming out party to the world open as open as quote they would ever be um in china and for putin you have to wonder now in retrospect whether he was softening us all up right because it was less than what a couple of weeks after the games that he took over the crimea which is i'm a sort of student of history is the only time since world war ii in europe that somebody has taken over somebody else's land by force um so, but it's what the country wants to do. Our country has a very interesting policy that I'm sure upsets a lot of people, but it sure has worked, which is the only money they put up for a games, they do not sign a check for anything other than one thing. They basically will support the security effort of a games in the United States, i.e. Atlanta, obviously, and, yeah. uh, and Salt Lake City. But everything else, other than an occasional thing, which makes sense, which is They'll use the fact that the games are a few years in the future to advance money for interstate highways and stuff that they would have gotten within the next 10 years, but they get it done in time, maybe six or seven years earlier. But we don't. That's one of the reasons why the IOC for so long, uh, among two reasons, didn't want to come back to the United States again, because they always feel, geez, we might get left holding the bag. Because yes. the United States does not sign a document saying that they'll pay for anything. Dick, um, my uh, my intuition, and it's not often right in in, in things of these matters. Um, yeah. My gut feeling is the ratings will be boffo because of the controversy. What is your what is your hunch? Well, I don't agree with it, Colin. I think they'll be boffo because the Olympics, first of all, are unlike any other major American television sports event. The viewership is dominated by women. Yes, uh, it's pretty much been sixty forty since the um, mid-90s, and that largely came from the fact that I reintroduced the storytelling that my first boss and mentor, Rune Arlegen, brought to the Olympics for the first time in the late 60s and 70s. And that storytelling is what made it something that women wanted to watch. I think a lot of people think I'm simplistic when I say this, but 90% of all the sports viewing by men is based on results. Women come to the Olympics for stories. They they relish the stories of what these kids are, you know, the vast majority of the kids, not the professional hockey team or the professional basketball teams, but the swimmers, the gymnasts, the track and field people in the main all live a pretty Spartan life just to have their several minutes of fame, maybe only once in their lives because the games are four years apart. So in this particular Olympics, NBC has a menu the first 10 days of the Olympics, which is largely in prime time. And those are the only ratings that anybody pays attention to, because that's where the majority of all the advertising dollars are. Um, the dominant, we have the best gymnast team, female gymnast team, not only that we've ever had, it's the best female gymnastics team that any country has ever had. It's a phenomenal story. USA Gymnastics which is uh, a great institution. It has its issues, too. I see USA Today today is talking about uh, sexual issues with some coaches. I don't notice that any of them have the names of national coaches, but that's a headline today. But they have a program that reaches so down 
into American communities everywhere that every four years we have two, three, four phenomenal gifted young women. We haven't been able to pull it off with the same regularity with men, largely because I think only the Carolis, the Carolis are only involved with women, and they're the ones who put together this wonderful training program. But the same has been true for decades with USA Swimming, and those two sports dominate the first 10 days of the Olympics, and they really set the record ratings uh, cycle for every Olympics, a summer Olympics. Do you- Dick, did you did you get the high out of the NFL or the Olympic? Because the Olympics is such an intellectual experience, and the NFL is more of a grind. Did the NFL experiences and the Super Bowls ever equal the Olympics for you? Yeah, yeah, very much so. In the last uh, uh, seven years of my career, uh, the Olympics probably are the thing that I'm most famous for having. Uh, sort of figured out the formula and using it time and time again, and no matter what the press had to say, it largely worked. Um, But Sunday Night Football was a a baby that I had worked on, Colin, for a couple of years to pull it off. And people say, well, what's different about Sunday Night Football? Well, for starters, I told the league I would develop uh, a cycle of talent, the likes of which they'd never had before for the game, the pregame. I would make it seem like an event. It was key to us to get the major highlight rights, which had been that ESPN a show for years, which aired on Sunday night that Tommy uh, Jackson was leaving after this weekend, and Chris Berman did. Yeah. But I wanted those rights because I wanted to give the Liga sort of a magazine of record or a newspaper of record that would air at the end of all the afternoon games before our game at night. And then on top of that, I really had a sense of scheduling of what would make football successful on Sunday night. And there were a lot of owners who didn't, even though there hadn't been much success on Monday night in more than 15 years on ABC at that point in terms of being a top 10 show, um, they thought, well, Monday night's what we know. And fortunately, the head of the TV committee, who was a dear friend of mine, Pat Bowen, believed in what I had had laid out, which was give us more than our fair share of traditional rivals, rivalries, Bears, Packers, Giants, Dallas, Giants, Philadelphia, um, Pittsburgh and <clears throat> Baltimore, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, anything with Green Bay's name on it. And that will carry us through a lot. Give us flex scheduling that you've talked about for years. Yes. And we will make it work together. And all those things came together. And from the very beginning, <clears throat> Sunday Night Football was the top 10 show on the most watched uh, night of the week. And within three years, it was number one show on television. And it's been that ever since. And no sports series, Colin, this is hard to believe in our country, had ever been the number one primetime show ahead of a drama, a comedy, or whatever. The number one show for the whole TV season. Wow. So that was a thrill. And it was the other part of it which was the ultimate thrill for me. I'd reached a point in my life where I could make the business side of my life be basically Monday through Thursday morning. And I flew out every Thursday and lived the whole experience from Thursday through Sunday night when we all flew back to New York. And Madden said in those first three years that he was there that it made a tough, a total difference in the way that the TV team was treated that they'd never had this phenomenon before since the boss, the boss of that particular network was at every game spent uh, Friday with the home team players and coaches and Saturday with the visiting team and Sunday there for the whole game, a, a full experience. The owners suddenly started coming around the games and the more they did that, the more they bought into Sunday night football. And it was very quick that it became the game. I'd say within two or three years, that was all the players realized that Sunday night was football night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it is completely completely stolen momentum from Monday night football. I don't think we've discussed that on this show several times. Listen, I have to – this has been an absolute uh, uh, pleasure for me, and uh, I love the business of sports. Uh, Dick Ebersol, former chairman of NBC Sports, Hall of Fame Olympics, and uh, digital and cable TV and broadcasting. Dick, I just this was just great for me, and I appreciate you giving us time. I've been trying to set this up for, for about two years, and thank you. You're more than welcome, Colin. Enjoy watching the Olympics, I hope. I will. Dick Ebersol. Good stuff.